called The Vault. And um, if you've been with us the last few weeks, you know just what we are doing. Um, in this 20th year of our church's story, uh, we've already had over a thousand Sundays uh, worshiping together, which means over a thousand uh, sermons have been taught. And what we wanted to do this summer was we looked at some things that were covered years ago and said, you know what, that might be a thing, good thing to go back to and revisit. So um, today I want to talk about uh, what I've called lessons for lion chasers. And it's something that I taught first in the Patchog movie theater in 2005. Few of you remember that, no? The great thing about doing church in movie theaters was, you know, you know, 20, 20, first century incenses, it's the smell of popcorn. <laughs> it's always a great thing to do church with this sweet aroma of popcorn around you. So in 2005, we were in the Patchogue Movie Theater, and we were, we were doing services there together. And uh, I, I taught one particular Sunday, I, I taught this, this message, um, and I went back to my notes, and I've taken a fresh look at them, and I really feel what it says here is something we really need to get a grasp of because the fact is this, the path to our greatest successes goes through our biggest fears. And one of the things that is vitally important for us to do in life is to conquer our fears rather than let our fears conquer us. Now, I don't know about you, but did you ever like in your Bible reading, you start enthusiastically reading a passage or a book, and then suddenly they've got a list of names, right? And you think, why the heck bother putting them in there? Because I can't even pronounce them, and why do I need to know them? And so, you know, let me ask you, do you sometimes skip over those? <laughs> Come on, you're in church, tell the truth. Do you, do you sometimes skip over those? It's like, yeah, good, catch you another day, right? on a few pages, settle down. To, yeah, because it's like, what the heck, you know? But the fact is, sometimes in, in the most obscure places in the Bible, there's some really good stuff. And, and there's, a, there's a passage in 2 Samuel 23 where, where it talks about some of the men who were key men who supported and helped King David, his key soldiers. And it says this, there was also Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant warrior from Kabzeel. He did many heroic deeds, which included killing two champions of Moab. Another time, on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. Once armed only with a club, he killed an imposing Egyptian warrior who was armed with a spear. Benaiah wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him. Deeds like these made Benaiah as famous as the three mightiest warriors. He was more honored than the other members of the 30, though he was not one of those three. But David made him captain of his bodyguard. Now, right in the middle of that, there is this particular statement which simply says this sentence, another time on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. Now, the fact is, even if you got to this, where it's got these lists of what they call David's mighty men, you, you might have got to that and just turned the page. But if you got to that and read some of this, it's like it's easy to read a sentence like that, and it's like, okay, so Benaiah on a snowy day chased a lion to a pit and killed it, and then we keep reading. But stop and think about that for a minute. So here was this guy out one day, I don't know, walking, and it was snowing. And suddenly, he sees a lion. Now, I really haven't taken lessons or studied greatly what you're meant to do if you see a lion, because I think it's like when they tell you on a plane, you know, if in case there is a landing on sea, do this. And it's like, no, if there's a landing on sea, you're done. Uh, you know, so, so I, I really don't know what you're meant to do when you see a lion, but I'm going to tell you this. I would probably not do what Benaiah did. I mean, I try to make myself inconspicuous. I would hope I was not wearing pink that day. 
So I've been trying to make myself look inconspicuous and I hide someplace, you know. Now, you can't outrun a lion. Apparently, lions can run up to 50 miles an hour. So you can't outrun a lion. And in fact, they can leap something in the region of 30 feet. So, you know, when they're quite some ways from you, they can still get you. They weigh between 330 and 500 pounds. So if you're running and that takes a leap and lands on you, you're done. You won't feel him eating you. You're dead. You're crushed. So what does Benaiah do? Benaiah doesn't try running. He doesn't try hiding. Here's what the Bible says Benaiah did. He ran after the He chased the lion. Hello, crazy man. He chased the lion. And apparently, the lion fell down into a pit. So what did he do? Seize his moment and run like crazy? No, he jumped down into the pit. Oh man, I tell you, some of this stuff in the Bible is worth really digging into and just taking a look at and thinking about what it says. So here he is. He chases this lion. It is a slippery. It is a cold. It is a snowy day. The lion drops in, falls into this pit. Benaiah jumps into the pit with the lion, and he kills the lion. Wow. That's some story. Why is this thing about, you know, why are all these lists in the Bible? Why is Benaiah there? I, I hope you'll kind of have a better grasp of that about 25 minutes from now. Because there's so much we can learn from Benaiah. Because actually this day became very much a turning point in the whole of his life. And there's a couple of things when I'm reading this story, I, I really want to uh, point out to you and encourage you in. The first thing is this. When it comes to facing our fears rather than running from our fears, it begins with this. We've got to embrace our identity. Now here's the thing. If I was to say to you when you walked in the door this morning, today I'm going to teach you about Benaiah, you may say, oh, that's good. What you really mean is I never heard of him, right? I say I'm going to talk about Paul or Peter, you know, or Jacob. It's like, yeah, got a pretty good idea. I heard that one before, Rog. Right? But if I say I'm going to talk about Benaiah, you've got very little idea who Benaiah really is because he wasn't anybody until he did a few things that were absolutely outstanding. I want to tell you this. There are no nobodies in God's kingdom. There are no nobodies in God's kingdom. So often we look down on ourselves and we feel as if we are lesser, but none of us is. The Apostle Paul said this in Galatians 1 and verse 15. He says, God who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by His grace. Paul talks about here the fact that actually from the time he was conceived, God had a plan for him. From the time he was born and he was called by God's grace. Now, if we could only grasp this fact that the truth is that every single one of us is here today in the family of God in the kingdom of God for this reason that the Bible says that before we were even created, that God called us, that God chose us. In fact, here's what the Bible says. It says, before God laid the foundation of the earth, you were chosen in Christ. That's who we are. And if we can only grasp how special we are and who we really are, because there are so many other things that we tend to draw our identity from. And those things aren't the things that define us. What defines us is who we really are in God. Now, if I was to take the time to say this morning to kind of chat to a few of you and say, how did you actually come to be here? I like to ask folks who are visitors with us, our guests, I like to ask them the question, like, how'd you find out about us? And the truth is, we're all here this morning, uh, and, and there's a multitude of roads we came down to end up here worshiping God together today. Multitude of roads. And the truth is, there's probably a time in our lives when we would never have dreamed that we would be here. So what happened? God has a plan. Before you were born, 
God had a plan for you. And one of the things we need to do is to embrace our identity, to know who we are. And when we know who we are, then the fact is we become the victor and not the victim. We stand straight instead of being bowed down. We face the opposition instead of fleeing from the op opposition. But Naya was an ordinary guy, but, but he was in the right place on a very significant day. Now, I've got to say this. I know that often the right place seems to be the wrong place. It's like, I can imagine that day, Benaiah, initially might have been thinking, why didn't I just walk on the treadmill at home today? <laughs> right? I mean, a snowy day, what's the matter with me? And I'm out here, and it's cold, and it's freezing, and I hate it, and, and now there's a lion. Why didn't I just stay at home? Sometimes the right place seems the wrong place. Sometimes the right time seems to be the wrong time. But the fact is this, the victory that Benaiah secured that day, what he accomplished in killing that lion was something actually that set him up for the rest of his life. It says later on that David made him the commander of his bodyguard. David's got his bodyguard around him. He's got these 30 guys, and they are special. They are there to protect the king. And David wants the commander of the bodyguard, and he starts looking at resumes. You know, so he looks at this guy, you know, so he looks at a resume, he says, this guy has put in 15 years of military service. He was, he was in the Air Force, and uh, he was highly commended. That's, that, that's a really good candidate. Looks at another guy, and he says, this guy's got all kinds of degrees, and he's really studied a ton of stuff that would be helpful. And then they say, well, there's Benaiah. So he said, well, what's Benaiah's resume? He say, uh, nothing much. Says he chased a lion into a pit on a snowy day and killed him. Yep, he's the man. <laughs> I mean, who do you want? He's the guy. And actually what happened is his life got turned around because he was not going to be chased. He was not going to be frightened by something that seemed so huge to him. He decided to actually confront his fear, and he decided to face his fear, and he decided to slay the lion and be done with it. And I'm going to tell you this. For some of us in our lives, one of the most important things we could ever do is to stop ourselves being hounded by the things that frighten us and haunt us and torment us, and instead to turn around and face them head on and to actually overcome them and fix them and move forward. Amen. Problem is, most of us kind of would look for, we're looking for a life that is risk-free, problem-free, pain-free. But I want to tell you this, taking no risks is the greatest risk of all, because that leaves you at the mercy of everything else. Our biggest risks become our biggest opportunities. Dr. Neil Rose wrote a book called If Only, and he said this, there are two kinds of regret, regrets of action and regrets of inaction. Sorry I did that. Sorry I didn't do that. Embrace your identity. Dream big dreams. Go after things that frighten you. George Leva and I were down in the Dominican Republic um, the week before last, and we went down to catch up with Pastor Freddie down there. And um, most of you know the, the, the whole story of, of how things are developing down in the Dominican Republic. So um, the church and the school that we uh, very much help to support and sponsor, uh, the school is just uh, bustling. Um, they have more applications for students to enroll than they are able to cope with. And so, a year and a half or so ago, uh, we decided that we would help them to buy the house next to the school, little house that it 
you guys gave the money for. We were able to do that. We went down to the closing early last year, and then we had a missions team went down in May of last year, and actually just the house was gutted and made into four more classrooms for the school. Uh, when I was down there uh, with George and Charlotte for the closing on that house, and as we're looking at that house, I looked, I, my eyes fell on the house next to it. And I said, uh, okay, now what's that house going to cost? And Pastor Freddie gave us a number, so I said, Pastor Freddie, do you think it would be good to have, these are small pieces of property, do you think it would be good to have that? And, and we did, you know, you know we, we talked about it a bit, and in the end, they actually discouraged me from walking down the block. <laughs> well, one thing they said is every time people see you coming, they raise the price of their houses, you know. So, <laughs> so um, long story short, we, we, we actually said, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Now, we didn't have the resources. See, you can either let your fears of failure or your fears of it not working out you can either let those haunt you or you turn around and you face them and you fight them. And so what we decided we would do, and uh, so many of you were here, is that on Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve, this past Christmas Eve, uh, which was a Sunday, our whole of our Sunday offering that day did not come into the church. That Sunday offering we announced would be to purchase this property in the Dominican Republic. And... Uh, I tell you, that, that, that Sunday, um, and I think for a lot of us, was a case of, I wonder how we'll do. And uh, what we did actually was came in at something like over 50% above what we actually needed, which was fantastic. You face your fears. You face your doubts. In the course of the final negotiations, they, the price was bumped up a little bit. But anyway, two weeks ago, they were able to close on that property. And we were able to go down and we were able to walk on that property. And then because the church is, uh, the church worships on the second floor, some of the school classrooms are on the first floor. What we talked to Pastor Freddie about was maybe on this property was to build a new church there, which would be on the ground floor, the first floor, which would make it a lot easier for folks who have trouble with steps. And then the whole of that building could be used for the school. And so we talked last week, a uh, week before, George and I with Pastor Freddie for some time about this and how it might happen. Uh, but then again, it's a big project. It's a simple building. And I said to Pastor Freddie, I said, look, I'm totally happy to go back to our folks and say, do you want to be a part of this? But I want your folks to be a part of it too. I said, that's not because I'm being cheap. I said, it's because they need to have some feeling of we did this. Not just the Americans built this church. It needs to be something they were a part of. And so Pastor Freddie said, well, I, I was thinking that, he said, we've done a rough assessment of how many blocks we would need, cinder blocks to, to put the building up. And he said, I was thinking I'd get our folks to raise the money for the cinder blocks. So when we were down there last, last week for last on the Thursday night, they did church service. I didn't know he was going to do this. Suddenly we're sitting there, Pastor Freddie's up talking, and somebody says something to the back of the room. I got no idea. He was smoking, talking Spanish. I got no clue. Okay, you want to say something about me? Say it in Spanish. I won't have a clue, okay? So, but thankfully, George was with me, but me and he speaks fluent Spanish. So George was there with me, and he said, somebody said they'll give 100 bricks. And it kept going on for a while with different people shouting different things. Some of them were going up to a table at the back and laying down money, and somebody was keeping numbers in a book. And by the end of that evening, I think we'd, they'd purchased about 40% of the blocks they'll need for that, from that Thursday night service. And if you translated that from their economy into our economy, you know what that really means? It really means that it, about 50 people maximum raised $50,000 US, committed to it that night. That is phenomenal. That is phenomenal. But, but if you live in the life of we could never do that, it's never going to happen. If you say that's way too big a project and let the lion chase you, then it's never going to happen. 
But if you face the reality and say, you know, you know, you know who we are? We are God's servants. We're doing God's work. And the whole purpose here is to lead young people, help boys and girls to really come to know Jesus and to start to live the kind of life God wants for them. If you know who you are and you embrace your identity, you just move forward, right? And, and so that's where, that's where things are at down there. That was so exciting. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Um, well, I guess I'm talking to you now, really, right? <laughs> I don't know if I cleared this with anybody yet. No, George and I decided it. We're good. We're good. How about Christmas Sunday this year? We give all of our offering towards putting that school up. <laughs> Church. Good. How many of you think that would be a good idea? Great. We don't vote on things in this church, but we just did. Okay. That's good. Now, let's go do it, right? Let's go do it. Life is too short to linger around in the shadows cowering from lions. What God wants us to do is to face our lions head on and to know the victory that God alone can do us. You say, give us. You know, most of us, you know, we cheer lion chasers on from the sidelines. We love to hear people's stories of great adventures, of what they were able to do, and God did with them, and God did for them. And we fail to realize the fact that God wants us to be the hero in our own stories. But we hide from the lions instead of facing the lions. Maybe you've got a God-sized dream that scares you. I want to encourage you. Don't hide away from it. Don't cower away from it. Start to pursue that dream. Recognize who you are, a man, a woman, with a God-given purpose and identity, and start moving towards your dream. Maybe your past stalks you, and that's what you're afraid of. Maybe there are things that happened in your life in the past, and the memories of them are so bad that, that they really do tend to dominate your thinking and fill you with fear or remorse or anger. And you know what you need to do? You need to turn around and face those things. Say, I'm God's child, called by Him, given His name. And you need to let me go. Face the things that you're afraid of. Don't let them intimidate you. We're called to look for opportunities. We're all going to face challenges and problems. But you know what? If we let them dictate our lives, we've missed it. What we need to do is with God beside us, we need to pursue the journey that God intended us to be living. Embrace your identity. You know what the Bible says your identity is? It's very simply this. The Bible says you're the head and not the tail. That's it. Succinct. You're the head, not the tail. That's who you are. Never forget who you are. Because life will try to tell you you're somebody else. God says you're the head and you're not the tail. Then the second thing, my Lord, look at the time. The second thing I want to say is this. Imagine the impossible. Imagine the impossible. Don't just press for what you can realistically expect. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Say, that could never happen. Who says it could never happen? You cannot say it will never happen with God. Faith is about seeing what is impossible. Faith is about looking at what couldn't take place and saying, you know what? I believe that God is going to come through and that God is going to do that. We need to be people who believe God for big things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, there had been a famine that had um, really caused devastation in Samaria. And the prophet Elisha in uh, 2 Kings 7 verse 1 made this announcement one day. He said, listen, God's word, the famine's over. This time tomorrow food will be plentiful. A handful of meal for a shekel, two handfuls of grain for a shekel. In other words, dirt cheap. The market at the city gate will be buzzing. But the attendant on whom the king leaned for support said to the holy man, you expect us to believe that? Trap doors opening in the sky and food tumbling out. You'll watch it with your own eyes, Elijah said. 
but you won't eat so much as a mouthful. So Elijah said, here's what's going to happen. The famine's over tomorrow. There will be food more than you could ever, ever believe. And so this guy is just looking at it from a natural point of view and saying, yeah, well, the only way that's going to happen is if windows fall in heaven, windows form in heaven and stuff falls out the sky. He couldn't believe it because it wasn't feasible. Then you know what happened the next day? The Bible says, miraculously, wonderfully, we don't have time to go into the story, God provided. But it says this in verse 20. The final stroke came when the people trampled that man to death at the city gate. Elisha said, you know what? It's going to happen, but you won't be a part of it. And he wasn't a part of it at all. Listen, God is a God who does big things. God is a God who does things that we could never, ever imagine. I don't want to be the guy who gets trampled in what God's doing. I want to be a part of what God's doing. I want you to be a part of what God's doing. And I want to encourage you to believe God for the impossible. Impossible odds set a stage for amazing miracles. I sometimes wonder if God ever gets, like, bored, right? It's like, you know, God bless me today. Yes, okay, I got that one. Ask me something hard. Because too often our prayers revolve around asking God to reduce the odds in our life instead of helping us to overcome the odds. We'd rather live with everything in our favor and not have to fight the battles, and I totally get that. But you know, the greatest tragedy in life is somebody whose God gets smaller every day. The size of the lion is never the issue. The issue is how big is your God? Some of you came in here this morning with the size of the lion right in your face. The impossibility of the challenge, the difficulty of things you're working through. And one of the reasons we need to be together, we need to worship together on a regular basis, is we need to be reminded who God is and who we are to God. And when we're reminded who God is, it doesn't matter how big the lion is because God's bigger. It doesn't matter how impossible the situation is because God thrives on the impossible. It doesn't matter if it could never happen because God loves it could never happen because then He gets the opportunity to show Himself as the God of faith and as the God of miracles. We can't structure our lives according to what is doable as God's chosen people. We need to be people who imagine the impossible and pursue it. And the road to that, very simply, this last thing is this. You've got to face your fears. Your fears. You can either let your fears dog you and run you down and destroy you, or you can face your fears and you lay them to rest. Your call. There's a story I tell over and again. Most of you heard it. Just, just look interested. I'm going to tell it again. <laughs> when we started, when, when part of our involvement in the Dominican Republic years ago was uh, we wanted to help a couple, Rob and Kelly Nelson, set up medical clinics. And uh, when we start, when we were going to help them get that started, uh, they needed a load of basic, over-the-counter kinds of medications. And so I'd been down in the DR with Rob and Kelly. I came back up here. We were in the Patchogue Movie Theater then too. And I, I, I said to our folks, uh, you know what? In this next couple of Sundays, if you can bring in a whole load, we had a list of stuff of over-the-counter medications. Um, we need to take them to the DR so they can do mobile medical clinics. And I said, the other thing we need is we need someone who can go to the Dominican Republic in two weeks' time, travel light, take two suitcases full of medications, not get caught, and... I leave them there. And, and the guy, there was a guy who came to me after the service who was a very kind of a impressive looking kind of guy, I'd, rec I'd say, statesman kind of looking guy. He was an ex-retired CIA, what do you call them? 
person. <laughs> so he worked for the CIA for years. He was retired. He said, I'd, I'd like to go to the Dominican Republic, but I've never flown for years. He said, I had a very bad experience flying. I don't fly anywhere. His daughter lived on the West Coast. Whenever they went to visit their daughter, they took the train. He said, I, I can't fly anywhere, though. But you know what? I feel God wants me to go. So the day he was leaving, we, you know, we fixed him up with, the, with these two suitcases full of stuff. He said, this is real weird because he said, sometimes I was the guy who was standing at customs watching people coming in with stuff. <laughs> so I said, good, you know how not to look then. <laughs> so, and we prayed with him. He took the stuff down to the Dominican Republic, left it with them while they got that ministry started. He came back. While he was there, though, in the hotel, he started talking to a doctor from the United States. And this doctor from the United States got interested in what they were doing. And part of the thing that has gone on from there is this. Every year now, this doctor takes a team of surgeons to the Dominican Republic, takes over the operating theater of the local hospital, and they, the medical care down there is, is pathetic. And actually, they do surgeries for people down there. And that all came because that one man faced his fears and went down. And actually after that, and ever since, he started doing missions trips all over the place. All over. You know why? He could have hidden from the lion which was flying the rest of his life. Or he could say, you know what? I'm going to push forward. And I'm going to face my fear. You know, if you were to... So when you go to heaven now and you're checking everybody out, right? And somebody says, I'm Benaiah, you'll have a vague idea, right? You're the crazy, right? Oh, you're the crazy guy, but, but don't mess with him, right? So, okay, yeah, I know all about you. Very interesting. But if you were to ask Benaiah, what was the scariest day of your life? I think he'd probably say chasing a lion in the snow and jumping in a pit after it. But if you were to say to Benaiah, what was the best day in your life? I think he'd say chasing a lion in the snow, jumping into a pit after it and killing it, right? Because very often, the best days of our life, they actually double up as the scariest days of our life too. But once we overcome that fear and see God come through, then they become the most wonderful experiences ever. Mark Twain once wrote this. A lot of you will know this. 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones you did do. So throw off the bylines. Sail away from the safe harbor. Catch the trade winds in your sail. Explore, dream, discover. An old English preacher, John Cardinal Newman, once said this. He said, fear not that thy life shall come to an end, but rather fear that it shall never have a beginning. And Jesus said this, I have finished the work you gave me to do. I want to encourage you today, in whatever way this might be relevant to you, pursue your fullest life, finishing the work God gave you to do. God wants us to be a church full of lion chasers, not people who hide from our challenges. And in whatever way that translates into your life right here and now, I want to encourage you today going out of here. Embrace your identity, who you are. Face your fears and see what God will do. Amen. 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 That bell means I'm finished. Let's pray together. Let's pray together as the band comes back up. Father, thank you for the reminder today of who we are. Lord, we're your children, called by you, chosen by you, special to you, and born with a God-given purpose. And God, I pray you'll help each one of us not to spend our lives crippled by fear, but Lord, help us to live our lives boldly moving forward to achieve your purposes in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing with the band as we close.